Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains in the Great War. And today, we're going to be discussing World War One, but specifically aircraft of World War One. Really bad aircraft of World War One because it's how we roll over here. Everyone likes me to get mad at really bad things, and yeah, that's 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 that's, that's how we're working. That's how that's how things are happening today and to be fair though i want to start off by saying this aviation technology was brand spanking new during world war one it had only been invented a little over a decade prior so there was still an insane amount of experimentation going on trying to figure out what exactly worked especially when it came to you know a war situation you can make an aircraft fly but could you make it actually maneuver and fight it's two different things, you know? But naturally, through the experimentation, there were some duds. Quite a few, actually. This is absolutely in no way the only list I could ever do about this. But I figured I'd make it a little more specific this time. These are five of the worst planes from World War I. The Kennedy Giant. Yeah, I know. Starting things off with a big chunk. At least in terms of early aircraft technology, I think it's fair to say that modern aircraft can be way, way larger than anyone ever thought possible. And this was a British biplane heavy bomber that was designed by Kennedy Airplanes Limited. Have you ever heard of Kennedy Airplanes? That's, that's fair, actually. They, they didn't really do that much. The design was actually an imitation of works by Igor Sikorsky. Yes, the legendary Igor Sikorsky. The owner of Kennedy Airplanes, C.J.H. Mackenzie Kennedy, had worked with Sikorsky prior to founding his own company. So him trying to duplicate what he had learned from Sikorsky definitely made sense. But, um, this plane was terrible. For one thing, like I said, it was big. And none of the hangars they had at the time, near Hayes Middlesex, where the prototype was being assembled, were large enough to house the thing. So they had to build it out in an open field. It was given four engines, given how big it was, which were Samson 2M.7 14-cylinder, two-row water-cooled radial engines. They were 200 horsepower each. Not bad engines for the time, necessarily, but uh, four was not enough. It was not enough at all. The aircraft was way too heavy. Empty weight on it was 19,000 pounds, 8,618 kilograms, far and away beyond what those engines could deal with. It only flew once, and it was discovered that it actually couldn't turn. At all. Seriously, it could only fly in a straight line if it got airborne, and it could barely get airborne. With that, the entire project was cancelled, and they didn't even bother scrapping it at first. It was left derelict for a number of years before they finally got around to ripping this thing apart. The Armstrong Whitworth FK-5 and FK-6. Now, it may sound weird to put two different planes on this list in the same spot, but they are directly linked in terms of their production and design. See, in early 1916, the British War Office drew up a very specific specification. They wanted a multi-seat escort fighter to be powered by one of the new Rolls-Royce Eagle engines, with an endurance of at least seven hours. It was intended to protect formations of bombers from German fighters, at that time, there still wasn't a good synchronization gear that would allow guns to be fired safely through the propeller disc. So all the designs that were submitted were a bit unconventional. Both the FK-5 and the FK-6 were triplanes, which had been proven somewhat effective in terms of maneuverability, but their overall layout was weird. They carried two gunners in nacelles that were mounted on the center wing, one to each side of the main fuselage. In this way, the gunners would have a decent field of vision in terms of being able to fire. And on paper, it might have made some logical sense to Armstrong Whitworth's chief designer, Frederick Kuhlhoven. The most notable things about these planes was probably that the middle wing had a much greater span than the upper and lower wings. However, the FK-5 was believed would have a lot of problems. In fact, it was so believed that this was the case that that design never flew. 
the head of Armstrong Whitworth's aircraft department, I, Fairbarn Crawford, refused to allow it to fly. He absolutely forbade it. So Coolhoven had to go back to the drawing board and produce the FK-6, which was similar, but unlike the FK-5, the FK-6's nacelles were slung under the middle wing and were shorter, rather than the FK-5, which had them on top and much further out. So the gunners wound up sitting behind the propeller. The fuselage was also redesigned as the FK-5 didn't give the pilot a very good view at all. The FK-6 was better in that regard too. Only one was ever built, even though four were ordered, because the one that was built demonstrated very poor performance when it was finally tested. And by that point, they actually figured out the synchronizing gear issue. So there's really no reason for the whole nacelle nonsense. They could just mount the gun on the main fuselage to fire through the propeller safely. The Sopwith Long Range Tractor Triplane. Speaking of putting nacelles on things to try to get around the propeller, the Sopwith also attempted this, and was part of the same British War Office request that the FK-5 and 6 had been produced for. Sopwith had decided to mount their nacelle up, very up, and they actually just modified an existing design for a two-seat triplane for theirs. With the nacelle on the upper wing, that did give the gunner a solid field of fire, like you could fire in pretty much any direction in that position. They also had a second gunner in the fuselage behind the pilot in order to guard the aircraft's tail. So again, on paper, it wasn't necessarily a bad idea, but again, the design had a lot of really, really, really obvious problems. It was nicknamed the Egg Box because of the nacelle. And for one thing, if the aircraft ever landed upside down, which did happen, the top gunner was absolutely hosed. There was uh, no way he was going to live through that if he was still in the nacelle. Also, uh, there was an issue of communication. And to be fair, the FK-5 and 6 probably would have had this problem too, but I think it would have been worse here because of how distant and far removed the nacelle gunner is from the rest of the crew. How in the world is the crew going to communicate with each other at all? They can't use hand signals because the cell gunner can't look down and see them, and they can't shout because, well... Hey, I see enemy planes! 11 o'clock! What? I said, I see enemy planes! 11 o'clock! What? I said, enemies! 11 o'clock! see how this probably wouldn't have been great in a combat situation. It also didn't really fly that well at all. And again, with the synchronization gear thing being solved, there just wasn't a need for this nacelle nonsense. So the project was abandoned. The Fokker V8. What is that? No, Germany, no. Yeah, this is a pentawing? I guess is what you could call that? Into plane? Uh, either way, okay, look, the idea was to add five wings to an airplane. See, in February of 1917, the British Sopwith triplane began to appear over the Western Front, and they proved really effective against German Albatross biplane fighters. Anthony Fokker responded to this by making his first triplane, the Fokker DR-1. Triplanes at the time were considered something to look into, as they were extremely maneuverable, which was highly advantageous in the World War I aerial combat. But Fokker got a little ahead of himself and decided that, well, if a triplane is great, well, obviously we just need more wings, absolutely. In his defense, that was a lot of designers' logic at the time. He believed having even more wings would be much faster, and since there really wasn't space to add more wings just up and down in the front, like with the triplane. If you put them both on top, they'd be too top heavy. And if you put them both on the bottom, they'd run into the ground. Instead, they mounted two extra wings in a biplane setup, but behind the tri-wing setup in this sort of tandem wing formation. And Anthony Fokker had so much confidence in it that he made the first flight himself in October of 1917. It was terrible. The whole thing was radically unstable in this configuration. It did not want to be controlled at all. It was only because Fokker was a legitimately great pilot that he survived, frankly. They attempted to modify it to make it work better, but it still just didn't function. The aerodynamics just did not allow for this to be stable in any way, and the entire project was abandoned. The Linke Hoffman R1 
Aha, I started with a big chungus. Now I'm ending with a big chungus. This very, very tall biplane was a heavy bomber designed and built by the German company Linke Hoffmann. Only four were actually constructed, and it never saw service with the Luftstreitkraft, which was the Imperial German Air Force. Why did it never see service? Well, this plane... Okay, look, it's not just the size that makes this plane weird and problematic. It's also the materials it was made out of. At the time, companies in Germany were competing to produce a giant aircraft, or Reisenflusung, for the German military. Linke Hoffmann, by the way, was principally a manufacturer of railway rolling stock. They had very little aeronautical experience. At all. But they designed the fuselage of the R1 to completely fill the interline gap of the widely separated biplane wings. This was done because of encouraging data from tests at the MLSTG laboratory at Göttingen, which suggested that there would be advantages in that configuration. The fuselage was, well, naturally very tall and large. It housed the crew compartments as well as the four engines and their clutches and combining gearboxes. Now that sounds weird, but that meant the engines could be accessed in flight for adjustments or even minor repairs. But there were serious problems during development with engine cooling as well as vibration. Most of the aircraft was constructed out of wood, which wouldn't have been unusual for the time, but it was covered by transparent selen, cellulose acetate, at least in the first prototype. Why that? That seems like a really, really, really weird material to use for this, and it was. It's a bioplastic, basically, and is often used as a film base in photography, as a component in some coatings or even a frame material for eyeglasses. The reason they chose it was because they wanted to make the aircraft partially transparent, and therefore less visible. They were trying to make a plastic airplane! The result had the opposite effect. The Celon actually reflected sunlight, it did not just let it pass through, and that made the aircraft MORE visible! And the Celon, when exposed to that much light constantly, quickly started yellowing due to ultraviolet radiation. It also shrank and stretched due to the in-flight temperature changes, and that had detrimental effects in the aircraft's trim. They didn't make any of the prototypes out of that stuff. They just used Lonzeng camouflage fabric in the second aircraft, which is a lot more reasonable and known to actually work. But like I said, the aircraft had other issues. The fuselage was so tall that it was divided into three levels. The top deck is what housed the pilots in the wireless station. The middle was the engine compartment, and the lower had the bombardiers, fuel tanks, and the payload. The problem with this configuration is that, well, all the weight, when it was loaded, would be in the bottom. When they dropped their ordnance and went to land, though, this would make the aircraft really top-heavy, and therefore prone to balance issues. Due to the pilot's position very, very high, it was very hard for them to judge the airplane's actual altitude, at least in relation to where the gear was, and the wings weren't built well enough. They were prone to warping and flexing. One pilot referred to the aircraft as not an aircraft, but a sickness. Yo. One of them crashed when the aircraft was at low altitude because the wings collapsed, so that was good, all but one of the crew survived. And another one was badly damaged when it nosed over on landing, and it wasn't repaired. There were two remaining aircraft on order, and both were completed, but there's no details of their flying history, and they may not have flown at all, because this design was prone to failure from the start. Lego Hoffman would go back to mostly working on trains after this, but to their credit, they actually went on to make the R-2, which was also another giant bomber aircraft. You'd think they might screw this up, but they really did learn from the R-1. The R-2 was way more practical in its design, and actually flew really well. Only two were built, however, and they were never deployed during the war because the armistice happened in 1919. They did test them, though. They actually wanted to make it a 12-passenger airliner after the war, but the Treaty of Versailles prevented them from doing so. Sad, because it seemed like they were actually on the right track with that one. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lorehawk 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsu, 131 232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life, Guy Anzac, A1, Arthur Roy, 
DM Tropa Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson, Dreyer Videos, Major Klutz, Hate to Grow, Master of None, Amtrak 2023 Productions, Dr. Racer 78, Crystal Morgan, and Ohio Trucker 1. Till next time, this is Darkness, and a bit of a fond farewell.